So about a week ago, I left the podcast saying we'll do our next episode on getting prepared for the general election. That idea has officially been scrapped. We are one week in and we are doing a podcast with myself, John Potter, and the Lib Dem podcast, along with Mark Pack, party president, and from the Nevermind the Bar Charts podcast. And for the first time on this illustrious channel, we have Bill Revens, the leader of Somerset Council. Welcome, Bill, first of all. Oh, fantastic to be here. Thanks for inviting me, John. Leader of the largest Lib Dem group in the country as well. well I think the largest sure get that in. Largest elected uh, Lib Dem group. The House of Lords is still bigger, but we're working on that one. <laughs> and as you heard there, we had, we do have Mark back. So, Mark, we will start with you. This whole episode is one week in. What have we learned and what do we do from here? So I suppose thinking about the Lib Dems, start of all, one week in, what have we learned? It all started remarkably smoothly. I was in um, RHQ for the first time uh during the campaign, about 48 hours after Rishi Sunak had called the election. And, you know, I'm sure, you know, you, John and Bill and others listening have, say, been to a parliamentary by-election early in the campaign. And you've got all of that feel of a campaign desperately gearing up, finding the property, all of that. So it didn't feel like that at all. It, it was almost felt like I'd walked in in the middle of week three of the election campaign. Both our staff and volunteers have done an absolutely fantastic job at getting the campaign up and running in a way that it feels like, the Tories have been caught on the hop more than us. I was my first canvassing session was in one of our target seats. Huge crowd of Lib Dems, loads of people out. You know, already got new leaflets for the election, and the Tory, our Tory opponent in that seat, was still on holiday. You know, so think which one of us was the one that could have had the advance notice here. So really impressive how quickly and smoothly everyone is geared up. Though obviously should acknowledge that for quite a few people who've suddenly had to cancel family holidays and so on, that's you know been a little bit of a personal price and we should be very grateful for everyone who has rapidly rescheduled or postponed uh, plans, especially for those who worked themselves silly in May and were maybe hoping to have some time with their family this this month. Yeah, Bill, do you feel the same? Uh, yeah, I think the incredible thing is how unprepared the Conservative Party was for this this election, right from from Rishi's, uh, Rishi's prancing in the rain outside mm -hmm. Down, Downing Street um, I'm hearing from conservatives locally that they had absolutely no idea that this was gonna gonna happen. Caught them completely completely on the hop. They've got candidates uh, not in place in, in in held seats. So Wells and Mendip Hills in Somerset. And, um, uh, the the Tory MP stood down uh, weeks ago, and they still haven't got a candidate there. And the general election campaign is going on. Meanwhile. Of course, good old good good old Tessa Munt. She's out there knocking on doors and delivering leaflets and and, and turning turning the the the, the hedgerows orange with stake boards. So uh, it's great to see us getting the getting the getting the, the flying start when they fire the the starting pistol. And I suppose we should thank you know regional officers. I think often um, party HQ staff are often maligned and forgotten about about how much they've got to do. But you know regional officers like so in the northwest. We have entered this campaign with every single seat ready to go, you know, you know, from non-target to absolute, uh, you know, the target seats of like Hazel Grove and Cheadle and Tim seat and everything else. I've, they've all been sorted. Candidates are in place. And we know, and this is a, a word of advice to all Lib Dems, there will be stuff that comes up. You know, so there'll be candidates that had to drop out. There'll be candidates for for or whatever happens. Things come up, but I will say the Lib Dems have been remarkably sorted, and even to the point where you know I'm not breaking any secrets here. You know, our flying start kind of leaflets, but our our teams had them printed in March, ready to go. You know, even packed, bundled up with deliverers, say hold on to this, put it on a shelf as soon as the election calls, go. You know, and that is wonderful organization from from the top to the bottom actually across the country to be able to get that sorted um but i suppose one of the things we one of the things that has started with us is obviously is the ed davy stunts mm. now i don't know mark if hq's had to up the public liability of our leader <laughs> in terms of this is this now a cost that we've had to do but for me, I know some lib dems uh i'll go to you first bill but some lib dems can be right sneering about this but for me it, it, we get so little attention in the media. Mm. This is something that is cutting through. Mm. And actually, Lisa, why why is he on Lake Windermere? Well, actually, it's about the sewage campaign. And it's a, it's a way of getting through, isn't it, Bill? 
yeah absolutely and i you know i i i i was i was surprised that we didn't have uh have tim farron uh doing full immersion baptism of ed davy in the in lake windermere as well you know just to just to add to the add to the excitement yeah it gets the media's attention but as long as it's directed towards a campaign message it's great if we're if we're, if we're just being silly for headlines then uh then it then then we're asking for trouble but yeah absolutely and um yeah just to build on the, the your, your earlier point we had we were in a full council meeting at the time the general election was called and we've got mm -hmm. eight eight parliamentary candidates across all the parties in the room and you know our our guys were itching to leave the room and I told them, no, we've got a vote to get through. <laughs> um, first. Um, you, you can go, you can go after that. And uh, I'm, I'm told that we had, we had uh, 50 state boards up in Taunton and Wellington that by, by, uh, by the, the end of play that day. So fair, fair play to the team that they went straight out off the marks and got out there um, with delivering, putting up boards and everything. Um, it's great. We've got to have that visibility. The stunts bring it, but the local campaigning brings it too. Yeah. Absolutely. And I, I can almost beat you. So I was I was at ALDC HQ delivering a webinar with Hannah Kitchen about how to keep your council seat for new councillors that have just won it. And, <laughs> and we, we could just because we knew it was coming, obviously, from about midday, I think we kind of figured it out. And Hannah Kitchen's messaging me saying, are we actually going to do this? I said, well, we have to do it until it's actually announced. And the the, the webinar was happening as it was announced. And you just saw people's concentration slow, really slowly yeah. going. But, but Mark, yeah, in terms of from HQ's point of view, I suppose we should also point out how much work goes into these stunts. Because I was at the, the Welsh party uh, bicycle uh, launch. Uh, it was actually just yesterday as we're recording this. And actually getting all that sorted, getting the press where they need yeah. to be, Getting the volunteers, making sure you know the area is secure. You've got rights to do what you want. Making sure Ed knows what he's doing. It's 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 a mammoth task. Absolutely, and there's a lovely. My favourite photo actually it, it isn't from Lake Windermere. It's with Ed doing the Welch campaign launch with uh, Jane Dodds and David, our, our constituency candidate. Um, and Ed is sort of freewheeling on a on a bicycle down a very steep hill, uh, you know, legs spread out. And I've just got this image of at various points, very early on a Sunday morning in previous months, Lib Dem press officers sneaking up that hill to try freewheeling to get the photo angle exactly right to, 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 to plan it out. But I think there is a serious point to all of this, which is actually one of the things that our 2019 election, sort of post-mortem, yeah, highlighted was in 2019 one thing that Boris Johnson was really good at and his campaign was really good at was the really strong visuals mm. and even if the accompanying story is negative or you know and and even if the accompanying story is full of you know attacks on you and so on if you've got a really strong visual the people making the choice about what footage to show in the on the tv program or what photo to put on print or at the top of the web page they love good strong visual images so you get this powerful image which we all know is the thing that draws people's eyes even if otherwise the media outlet isn't really giving you much of a fair crack of the whip in, in the copy and we've seen this in the telegraph there's a lovely couple of full pages where you know some of the copy as you would expect from the telegraph is is giving us a bit of a kicking but then you've got this huge photo of ed and uh, jess our candidate in chichester you know sailing on a boat on that occasion, I think probably Jess was grateful that it was just all in the boat. No, you know, no direct contact with water required. But it's a lovely photo. And that's what grabs that's what grabs your attention. That's what. So it, there is there is serious thought behind it. And but also, I think people want politicians to be authentic and they want to believe that the party they're going to support is doing well. And so just being relaxed and confident and if you fall in the water, taking it good humour and getting straight back up and then falling in again. That's, you know, the the, the famous Ed Miliband bacon roll uh, photo was in part a famous photo because in a way he didn't fully embrace it. You yeah. know, it was, oh, no, this isn't gaff, this is horrible, this isn't unfair. No, it's just have a bit of, have a bit of fun. Yeah. Absolutely. And I suppose going on to beyond stunts is what local parties can and should be doing. And Bill, you've already raised about getting visual early. <laughs> but obviously, we, we a lot of campaigners listen to this podcast. So obviously, with a truncated timeline and a snap election, everyone has been caught on the hop with this, especially Tory MPs, it appears. But actually, <laughs> things like, so I've talked to my council officers about, okay, you know, 
ring up your councils, find out when your postal votes are landing, because mm. that's really crucial, because everywhere will do it slightly different. So I know exactly when uh, mine would, uh, my uh, parliamentary seat, when they will, the first day they could possibly drop. Figure that out. Get your state boards out early, because again, getting out early visually, because like I said, things will things will happen in your campaign that you can't think. So we've now got a local by-election, annoyingly, on the same day as the general election. So this is stuff that you can't prepare for. Decided The former um, Labour MP for South Ribble, David Borrow, who's a Preston City Councillor, has had a, had a big argument with the Preston Labour Party and has designed to resign and at the same time as the general election. So we have all that to deal with. Or your printing's delayed, because we've had a bank holiday right when you'd actually expect, or Royal Mail's being slow checking your artwork. There will be things that come up, and just remember, take a breath, <laughs> and just do what you can. Because, Bill, I suppose with this thing, I mean, you've, you've been around for lots of campaigns. You know, you know, you can make the best laid plans you can, but there will be stuff that will come up. Yeah, I mean, in any campaign plan, the first the first rule is flexibility. Yeah. Um, I don't think I've ever had a had an election campaign where my card hasn't broken down at some point. <laughs> um, and, and no, the last one, my, my son's car that broke that broke down. I had to lend, lend him mine to get to work. You know, and you you just work around those <laughs> those, those problems and you work around them with good humour as best best you can. Yeah, the, yeah there are going to be things that irritate you. Um, it would it's a, it's a very high pressure emotional time, especially. You know, it, when it, especially when it's your name on on the ballot paper, but um, you know the, the the reality is the general election. You know, it's it's we're, we're part of a team, and it's that Liberal Democrat team that gets us over the line. I've fought, I've, I've fought fought elections in good times and in bad, um, but you've got to enjoy them all and uh, it, getting that visibility. Um, you know, in terms of local photographs, I remember remember reading a really good book by I can't remember who it was by, and it's something about the left nostril photograph. I can't remember anything. And Mark, perhaps you could re remind me. You're a well-read chap. Yeah, it's my basic tip is if you ever look at campaign photos, I have never seen one taken from too close in. There are loads that are taken from too far away, but there's never any where you think, oh my goodness, I can see the candidate's left nostril. This is far too close in. So whenever you're taking a photo, however close you think you are, always take an extra step forward. If you're on the edge of the pavement, look before you take the step forward, obviously, <laughs> but always take a step forward because you can always get closer. It always makes the photo better. It's almost like I think uh, good campaign photos are the opposite of good holiday photos. So with a holiday photo, you sort of know that you and your partner, child, whatever friend were on holiday and you being small in the photo, but the background where you were, that's what you want dominating the photo. Actually, with a campaign photo, it's the opposite. You want the people to be really at the heart of it. Yeah. So take a step forward. Absolutely. And so um, we're going to talk a little bit now about what we what as Lib Dems we should be doing now, because clearly we've we mentioned we constantly mention about you know targeting whether that's in your local wards whether it's where your councils but in a general election it's especially important we've talked about how lib dems have you know a few dozen seats that we are basically just by elections we have just got to pump everything into them and whether you're places like bill which has a lot of target seats around there or mark in london you know you have a good watch of seats that you're hoping to it was obviously. so lovely getting the train the other day and thinking this train goes to three target seats yeah. i can choose i've got a choice here that's, that's lovely, lovely, or, lovely or in places like myself where up in the north where you have slightly less options in terms of type there's a lot of places we're hoping to build yeah. our goal that's good public transport and fewer target seats that's a story that will have really riled you john <laughs> yeah absolutely um but it's actually we've got to play our part you know, and that's whether, so on Sunday, I'm going up to the lakes to help Tim, you know, because he's, you know, trying to win in his, his new constituency. And if you, because if we don't and we spread ourselves too thin and as a candidate, it can be really galling for you. And, but you've got to remember that if, say in my patch, um, the Lib Dems go from one seat up to three in the Northwest, that gives us capacity to move forward in in future years. And it's just having sometimes that longer term view, as frustrating as it wants to be, because all your friends are saying, yeah, go on, do it. Well done. Congratulations. You're going to do it. But Mark, we've, we've just got to be disciplined, I suppose, at this point. Yeah. There's, um, there's a number from the local elections, which I think we should all bear in mind, which is the number 97. So if we had persuaded just 97 people, 97 more people, 
to switch to us in the places that matter, we would have won outright control of three more councils, 97 people with a difference between three more bills and and not. And that, you know, that that's a, it's a horrible, horrible, thin, small margin. And I think the reason to emphasise that is, you know, in 2019, our vote share went up by half. But we don't look back on 2019 as a brilliant triumph because the seat number actually fell back. And 1997, those of us who've been around for a bit longer, think of it as a brilliant result. Although actually our vote share, it you know, fell slightly in 97, but our seat number more than doubled. The number of seats we get is the absolute determinant of whether we will have a success or not. Now, I was ch- talking to a chap who has got a council by-election in a Labour ward, uh, coming up in which he's the candidate. He's been doing stacks loads of canvassing. I'm certainly not going to begrudge him working really hard in his council by election and maybe, you know, taking having a chance of taking a seat off Labour. But in as much as we can, if we're not in target seats ourselves, helping up the seat number is really crucial because we all benefit from that. More MPs, more often Ed will be on PMQs in the next parliament. The more voters in all of our seats will see the Lib Dems in the media, for example. And just before Bill comes in, I suppose I'll use the example because we've got, like I say, now a council by-election. One of the seats we took off Labour just a few weeks ago. So for us, it was like, it's a chance for us to really go out again. But we have to remember that this this seat will come up again in 18 months. Mm. You know, that's what we've got to remember. So, And it's going to be those of you that do have local fights at the same time, because I know there are quite a few that have been called since, since May, um, is that you are going to have plenty of chances to do it in terms of if you're electing in thirds, but also how difficult it's going to be with... So we're working on, like, if turnout doubles, and we I remember 2015 when we had council elections and we had a ward where we had basically a 500 majority the year before and the year after, on the combined day, it went down to 13. That's how close... And that's how difficult it is when you have a combined general and local election. And Bill, I suppose, you'd kind of reiterate all that, I imagine. Uh, Yeah, absolutely. I was just thinking about Mark's train ride, and I think I've got bicycle rides where I can hit three target seats from where I live at the moment, which gives us gives me a fantastic choice of places to go and campaign. Um, And I will try and get to, to, to everywhere um that uh that where we got got a strong chance of of, win, of winning an mp not discounting um some some unexpected uh eventualities as well i think this is going to be a very strange election um particularly if reform do re- reforms take more votes off the conservatives than than we're thinking so they, they seem to be a little bit shambolic one of the things i would say to those uh, those hosting constituencies when people come make sure you're welcoming and make sure you give people lots and lots to do um and my final thing would be my, my i remember an election where i had a i had either poll i was absolutely knackered and i had a pile one more pile of leaflets to do and i just thought i can't do it and make my way through polling day i ain't gonna do the, that pile of leaflets and i lost by 20 and i've yeah. always thought my goodness, if I'd just gone out and delivered that two two hundred leaflets, would that have made the difference? Yeah. Um, don't leave anything. Don't don't leave anything back. Back. Put every ounce of energy into making sure we get the result. And Mark's absolutely right. The success criteria in a general election is how many members of parliament we we end up with, because that will influence how we do over the ne- the term of the next parliament. So, you know, if we if we're well into the 30s, 40s, 50s, as uh, some of the opinion polls are, are telling us, that is a fantastic result for the Liberal Democrats. So we need every vote, but we also we also the first criteria is every single seat that we win in parliament. Before we move on, Bill, I'm just I'm just conscious because obviously quite a lot of people listening to this are also local in local government as well, councillors, campaigners, activists, leaders, leaders of the opposition. So, from your point of view, as in running a council, how are you going to balance that next these next five weeks now in terms of and still do because obviously we I think so. I'm now leader of the opposition. I've now got to start a whole new scrutiny regime and all that sort of thing. So I have to kind of work this in along with a general election chaos. So I mean. I assume some of your officers are cancelling uh, non-important meetings and things like that. But how are you dealing with that as a council leader? Uh, yeah, absolutely. It's it's around managing your time effectively. So uh, if uh, I'm I'm not going to be able to go knocking on doors at uh, 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 
seven o'clock in the morning. So that's the time to to deal with the email backlog. And uh, not not during the middle of the day when I could be knocking on doors or pushing pieces of paper through them. Um, you you make sure you manage your time effectively. And you know there, there there's a really good book which, which one that wasn't written by Mark Pack actually um, called uh, "Well, Does It Make the Boat Go Faster?" Which is um, about the row, uh, the rowing eight uh, in one of the Olympic Games, and every decision they made was around will it will it make their boat go faster? So will it make our MP tally go go higher? Will it make our vote go higher? Um, and it, um, we, we think about it in that perspective, but we, we mustn't forget that in running councils, we do things that affect people's lives on a day by day basis. So there are times when when councillors, particularly those who are in control, will need to take a step away to deal with something that may well be uh, absolutely essential to somebody's life. Um, that's as as uh, many many folk will realize we, we 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 spend a little bit more as liberal democrats in local government than than we than we do in uh, in 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 parliament we 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 we're, we're possibly the more influential uh, than our mp's although uh, the media and and the party may not realize it sometimes no and when i was talking earlier about um things that come up it, i mean it very for people like myself as a councillor uh, it'll be like a certain situation comes up or a certain, you know, levelling up fund bid has to has a critical deadline or something like that, that you just know as frustrating as it is. And it will be the one sunny day of the week that it happens that you can't, but you just have to carry on. But speaking about just have to carry on, let's get on to the Tories and mm -hmm. how this week has been. Because I'm, I'm of the opinion, you know, Obviously, there's funny things that we as complete political nerds find quite amusing. You know, Rishi Sunak going to the Titanic Museum uh, and Quarter, which is absolutely brilliant in Belfast. If anyone does, it is an absolutely brilliant museum and area of Belfast to go to. But obviously, the symbolism of that was very funny. But actually, the vast majority of people won't know or care. Or, or so. But it does, Mark, I think, mm. say something about the disorganised nature of the Tories and how just, I, I mean, I'm astonished, actually, how poor some of their organisation has been at the start of this, and it just yeah. seems just shambolic. When Rishi Sunak was calling the election being drenched in the rain, there was a little bit of me that was thinking, just remember when the, the stuff we've had in the past, like when Boris Johnson hid in a fridge and, and he stole a journalist's phone and all of that sort of stuff. And then he did go on to win the election. So there was a bit of me thinking, maybe there's something smart about this that I'm not appreciating. But then when you had the whole sequence of other things, I actually know... This it it's it's just it's almost like his team haven't really done a general election before, and so they don't quite know what to get right. Which is an odd thing to say because if you look at the cast list of names, they definitely are people with experience of different national campaigns. But it, it's yeah, it's pretty error prone. I think also what we've seen is that it is a very defensive core vote campaign. You know, they are trying to hold on to. Um, sort of typically uh, more right wing, older voters who are flirting with reform. You know, if, if you say who is their classic voter they are aimed at, it's probably a man living in northern England in their 60s who voted Tory in 2019, voted Leave in 2016 and is fairly hostile to immigration. That's your yeah, archetypal target. And that's uh, we're trying to win 200 seats rather than 100 seats sort of type frame. Yeah. Um, so it'll be interesting to see whether they they become a bit more uh, optimistic in their campaign and whether actually, you know, Rishi Sunak spends more of his time, say, down your way, Bill. Um, but at the moment, it seems like it's a very defensive campaign, which is you know, good news from our point of view about what that's telling us, what that reveals to us about what their data and their polling is telling them. That said, you know, there have definitely been elections where we've gone in with great hopes and those hopes have not lasted through till the exit poll on you know mm. a five minutes past 10 on polling day so for all the the tory campaign seems to be stumbling we sh definitely shouldn't underestimate them and the fact they will outspend us what probably 10 to 1 during this election so they can throw a lot of money at cover you know at, at compensating for their stumble so i am yeah pretty optimistic i think things have got off to a really good start for us but we definitely need to keep our eye on the prize of those target seats. Well, I mean, do they have any other option, though? This, I mean, this is just on that about their strategy. I mean, I, I, I mean I've mean, i said on a previous podcast, I would, going after the far right kind of voter, 
kind of thing. A, I don't know if they've already left them anyway because reform is a natural kind of protest form. And if you're disgruntled, are you going to get them back? Whereas those moderate Tories that left them in, uh, left them in absolute droves to almost not, not push them aside, but kind of just like kind of hope and pray that they will stay with us while concentrating on the more fringe. I'm not sure that's a great strategy to be going on with, Bill, but is that like the only card they've got left? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's clearly a damage limitation uh, campaign from their point of view. They, 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 same as us, they want as many MPs as possible. And they will have done, they've got the money to do the polling and the focus groups and all of that, all of, all of that. It'll be, it will be a, a well thought out campaign to limit the damage that there is. But yeah, you know, the conversation, yeah, we, 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 we're in a, Trixy financial situation here in Somerset. We've had a number of conversations with government ministers. It's been very plain that uh, they've been they've been saying this is a problem for the next government, and 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 that was ne and it's never um, with the thought that they might be the next government. Um, and uh, they they are merely in the game of trying to re minimise the damage that's going to be done to their campaign. So everything seems to be going going in a positive direction for us in in the areas where our target seats are um where we rely on the conservative vote being being lower and our vote uh, uh being a little bit higher with a squeeze message um we we're, we're, do, we're doing all the right things um but there's a lot of time in our election I think all sorts of things can happen um all we need is for one scandal or one stunt to go to go wrong and we're back on the defensive and uh, we 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 might be in trouble. We've been been through enough election campaigns to know that uh, you don't take anything for granted until no. ten o'clock on Parliament Day. There is one thing though that really puzzles me, which is why Rishi Sunak called the election when he did, in a way that sunk his incremental smoking ban. You know, if you think about what might his legacy be, what might he be remembered for in twenty or thirty years' time. Actually, if he had got that legislation through and given it had backing from the Labour Party, it would have almost certainly stuck through what is likely to be a Labour government after the next election. And you know, in terms of and I know, you know, particularly amongst ourselves, because we're liberals and we don't like banning things, you know, it will, it will there's a very lively debate amongst Lib Dems as to whether it's the right or wrong thing. But if you just think about it from his perspective, if he had got that legislation through by calling the election slightly later and being really determined that that was going to go through, you know, as quickly as possible in Parliament, that would have been a, actually a pretty impressive legacy for him. It would have really made him stand out from Liz Truss if we're talking about him versus Liz Truss, you know, X years down the road. Whilst in reality, unless their campaign really pulls off something miraculous, they're much more likely to be bracketed together as the two faces. I'm, I'm just really puzzled at his... He appeared to be genuinely a believer in the smoking ban, which is why he wanted the government to ban something, despite being nominal, you know, a right wing politician who should be against that. Yeah, he seemed to genuinely believe in it, but not believe in it enough to want it to be his legacy. It's just really yeah, weird. and things like Martin's Law as well. So he met the one of the victims of the Manchester just... bombing on the day he called it. It, just, it, it everything just didn't make sense. You're and, right, and and the woman he was meeting, he could have said to her, you know, he could have been very genuine about, I really want this to happen. Look, you do know there's going to be a general election this year. I'm not quite sure what will happen with the... You know, he could have been genuinely supportive of her and added a caveat that didn't mean that she felt betrayed by him, you know, when, when he calls elected. Really, I mean, that in a way I find easier to understand because that's just being a poor politician. And I think that's yeah. sort of what we've learned. Yeah. But why does he care so little about a policy that runs against, in a way, his natural political instincts and which was controversial in his party, yet he believed enough to make a big centrepiece. Of, and yet he then abandons it. It's really, I, in a way, I, I mean, obviously, I hope that he has shown the door in this general election, but I sort of wish he had been around for longer because then we would get a really good biography of him by somebody that might actually explain that curious paradox at the heart of his personality. Go on, there is a there is, of course, a theory that uh, that there were that there were sufficient letters being gathered to possibly to undermine him to, <clears throat> to replace him for for an autumn election, yeah. and and hence it was a cut and run. I've got no no mm -hmm. insight or evidence as to whether that is the case, but uh, but I do I do think 
you know, to be to be absolutely fair, I don't think it was. I think the lettuce um, in, exceeds uh, Liz Truss as an effective prime minister. So I do think I don't think uh, Rishi Sunak is quite that low um, in terms what, of what vegetable would you <laughs> buy him as? He's higher than lettuce, but what? Yeah, what, yeah, it needs, be, it needs to be a, it needs to be a root vegetable. Uh, <laughs> I think something which which which, which 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 survives a little bit bit longer, maybe a turnip. Or slight, something slightly pickled, which again fits into the political narrative just right, doesn't it? But I mean, it's it is, and it was interesting his body language on the because he obviously did PMQs the day he called it as well. And I think I can't remember which other podcast said it. He said he looked like the weight of the world had just been lifted because he knew he was he was going to call that election at that yeah. point. And I, there's a strong part of me that just thinks he just had enough, you know. I, I, I he had just thought, and and I think the disparate nature. Of the Tory party at the moment, in terms of you know the, I mean, I mean Steve Baker's line that you know what well, I'm just going to go off to Greece and I'll do my campaigning from there, and that's a minister, you know. I just think there's just no cohesion with it. They just, I don't know whether they just dislike each other or they've just had too long in power or or they're just thinking, all right, well the exit's only months away, now it's only a week away or weeks away. I don't care anymore. It just feels rotten bill and i just i just can't you know as someone who you know you have a bigger group than me but if you had members of your group behaving like that you just think we are not in a great place no that's definitely a time when you would you would be, be looking to have a conversation but it's also about how you lead a group isn't it and and how you try and try and uh make sure you're all, 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 all pointing in the same direction um, it was Joe Grimmond who said we yeah, march towards the sound of gunfire, which is you know, exactly you know, where, what needed to happen and what didn't hasn't happened. Uh, I, I can I can do I see a golden retriever behind you? That was my golden retriever just yes. checking in checking in on me. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Mine's, mine's around here somewhere, John. We, 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 the we, the we, random we, points I go <laughs> on mute, Bill, is because any time the dog goes past the front window <laughs> is why. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I now want to sort of just slip in comments like, and it's really important that lots of activists go for very long walks just now. <laughs> See if <that. laughs> he is pricked up completely. Yeah, absolutely. But yeah, it's just, I, I mean, Mark, you probably, because you're London based and you probably have greater chats with MPs that also have chats with their Conservative colleagues. It, it must I mean, there's a there's a resignation to them. I think a lot of it, but I mean, what do you feel from a yeah, kind of hatred? I, mean, I think point part of it. I, I guess we have experienced on a very small scale something that's really happening in the Tory Party, which is around our conference. You know, we have when we've had to cancel conferences previously, and the talk about what we would do for our conference this autumn before the election was called. People can get very irate if they've done something like they think they've booked some hotel rooms on the expectation something's going to happen, and then it changes, and then they have to cancel it. But for what's happened for a lot of Tory MPs and their families is they were you know, told it's OK, you can book a summer holiday or the election will be in the autumn, extend the, you know, the rental contract on your flat for six months. So, so people feel in quite a personal way that their lives have been deliberately disrupted by the prime minister choosing to have his team tell them something that was untrue. And even within the confines of having to be, you know, secretive about when you might call the election, if you then are secretive, call the election, catch your own side on the hop, and then have dumped all of these people into these situations like, you know, I'm on the holiday with my family, that's that's a, just a really bad way of treating colleagues. And I, I, and I, it just it just shows a complete lack of sort of empathy for the yeah. for fellow humans. And, yeah, and it's. I, I, I mean, we'll get on to empathy for fellow humans now by moving on to Labour. Mm. And now this is now this is obviously as we're speaking today. Labour have got maybe their first bit little wobble of the campaign. Mm. For those that don't know, we're recording just as the issue regarding Diane Abbott mm. and another candidate in uh, London as well being deselected. I mean, Keir Starmer has been. This is this is not new. Keir Starmer has been utterly ruthless in terms of candidate selection. Only very few kind of very left wing uh, MPs have actually made it onto the short list and then onto the and we enough quite a few of them are in Lancashire, strangely enough. But um, do we think? And this is maybe one for you, Bill. I mean, there's a lot of chat. Is he's, he's you know he's showing ruthlessness and that's good politics. Is it good politics? I suppose is the question. Oh, no, no, it's it's authoritarian um, politics, and that's exactly. 
um why why we're not the labor party in many in in many senses and uh, you know that we are a liberal party and we celebrate our diversity we don't uh, we don't use it as a wedge to divide ourselves with um and you know you go, you once you've got that um culture within an organization that we have that 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 feeds through um i'm i've never been uh, tempted to by by by, by the Labour Party at any point in, uh, in 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 my lifetime because of that uh, faction ridden culture that they've got that uh, one side needs to needs to annihilate the other other side. Uh, we saw it when Jeremy Corbyn was was leader. We're seeing it when Keir Starmer was leader, and I don't think it does credit on either wings of the Labour Party. And uh, it's it's desperately disappointing. For British politics to see that authoritarian streak that's there, and it worries me when we, if we do have a majority Labour government that we will see that authoritarian streak mm -hmm. shine through for the next term of this Parliament. Um, and uh, the need for the Liberal voice to be as strong as possible in Parliament is uh, is writ large. And I suppose, Mark, I mean, maybe I'm I'm, I'm going to play devil's advocate a little bit here. So he is pivoting to win whatever he needs to win next. You know, in terms of, he said what he needed to say to win his leadership, and now he's saying what he needs to say to win from opposition. Mm -hmm. Will he pivot again, once in power, to say what he needs to say to re reaffirm his base and maybe get a second term? Now, the argument to and from that is, A, that seems like a way of winning, but B, is it storing up problems in the future? And once you've played that trick... How many people think, well, I can't trust you because you said this and now you've done that? Yeah. I think the my impression of him so far is that Keir Starmer is behaving in politics like he behaved before he got into politics, as in like a lawyer. By which I mean, if you're, say, a criminal barrister, you might rock up one week in court and argue really strongly about how conclusive the DNA evidence is in one case. And then you might rock up in court a few weeks later and in a different case start poking holes in all of the doubts about how rigorous the DNA evidence is. And nobody says, oh, this is awful. This lawyer is being inconsistent. You know, he's taking the opposite view from... Because that's your job as a lawyer. You pick up your brief and you argue it to the best of your ability on behalf of your client and the judge or the jury then, you know, make their decision. And and in a sense, that's what you feel like. He, he What was the brief for winning the Labour leadership election? Then what was the brief for trying to win a general election? What we don't know... And maybe what he doesn't even know himself is actually when it comes to the stress of office, if, as is likely, he's prime minister in a few weeks time, what does he really believe? You know, and I think if he does have a core set of beliefs that he is being very ruthless, even cynical about trying to implement, that will go a lot better for him than if actually at the heart of it, there isn't there isn't any real core core beliefs. And. You know, I think that's just an unknown. You know, we will we will discover over over, over the coming years. But I do think there is um, I, th I think there is a degree of professionalism about the Labour operation, which we should definitely acknowledge, but in a very different way, take that approach ourselves. So I, I think there is real value in a sort of democratic professionalism in that sense. You know, I, I do think, you know, people have heard me talk about our parliamentary selection processes and internal elections in the past. You know, I often say we are not tough enough on ourselves. We are not rigorous enough in putting candidates through their paces, asking the really difficult questions, flushing out problems in advance, etc. But that's all within the frame of having a democratic process yeah. that gets you that more professional, more effective outcome, as opposed to the Labour very authority. You know, the Labour candidate process involves their equivalent of the federal board sitting down in a few days time with a list of every Labour candidate in the country and saying yes or no to them. I mean, just I'm just trying to imagine how I would chair that if that were the federal board meeting, if that was the Lib Dem process. And just all of the, you know, just think about the dynamics about who knows who, who's got a friend on the board who would speak up. You just, ugh. but definitely we should not, you know, we should acknowledge that professionalism is important, but you can do it in a democratic way. And that's clearly not the path that Starmer has taken. Yeah, it's that culture point, isn't it? But the other thing that concerns me as well is, you know, we, we went through a phase of having um, three word slogans were mm. to 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 win elections. We, we appear to have got, got, gone down to the point of a one word slogan um, yeah. with with the Labour Party and you know, with with trying to work out what 
the future of local government as the mm. leader of a principal authority, I've been trying to work out what the Labour Party policy is around local government. I still don't know. Mm. Um, I doubt I will know um, in, 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 until until probably Christmas. Mm. Um, and that's really worrying because uh, if we do have a majority Labour government, I don't know what they're going to do. And I think this reflects badly on both of them. Sorry, Mark, I was just going to say, so if the Tories do a kind of slash and burn routine, you know, we'll just leave it to the next guy, that is that is an absolute doubt. And whatever you can say about, I mean, I was a little bit too young for, you know, for Major and Ken Clark. They didn't want to leave the country in a hole for just so it would be a, an electoral advantage for them after 97. But also from Labour's point of view, it's a real risk because I remember the, my county budget and Labour, obviously, we're going to take this county next year and all the rest of it. And I said, well, you guys are now going to have to, opposition's easy. And you guys are going to have to decide what you're doing. Because at the moment, we've heard not a a whistle about what Labour's plans are for local government, other than the fact that Rachel Reeves saying there's no magic money tree regarding it. So all the, these are big decisions and awkward decisions. And Labour's strategy at the moment is say nothing, hope the Tories implode. But that, that isn't going to get them all the way through the election, is it, Bill? No, we've got local government, we've got the health service, we've got uh, education, all of which are in, se- in severe difficulties, teetering on the edge of a collapse of, in public service. And I I don't know what any future government will do that's different. Um, mm. uh, you know, these, are, these are problems that affect everyone's lives. Uh, we can only kick that can down the road for so long. And a lot of the problems that we're experiencing around, say, recruitment um, of, of of teachers, doctors and um, other medical professionals or, or the rising cost of social care, these, these have been problems that have been mm. known for years. And it's that short termism in politics that we've seen that it's only about the electoral cycle who can cling on to power for as long as they can rather than the the fundamentals which is what's in the best interests of the country so yeah. for me um i think we've reached a we, we've reached a tipping point it's why i'm pleased to see uh, proportional representation back higher on the party's agenda in 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 recent years because i think that was a, that was a there was certainly a message that brought me to the 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 liberal cause um when i was a youngster of the, of, the, of trying to bring that long termism yeah into politics we're all about the short term and that's never helpful for a country but does mark does the nature of a snap election give labor a bit of a get out of jail free card because obviously it's not in terms of you know no manifestos have yet been published i mean i'll i'll probably ask you in a second on on when we think our manifesto might be published but it also because it's so rushed and it was a snap election it gives them a thought, well we would have had this in our manifesto, but obviously we didn't have time to flesh out absolutely everything. Have the Tories given them a little bit of a get out of jail? Free card? Maybe, but I think what is significant in that respect are the number of taxes that Labour have ruled out. Mm. You know, any you know raising at any point in the next Parliament, and this week they've added an extra one to that list in terms of VAT. So they do seem to be blocking themselves in mm. to quite a narrow set of options. Uh, for a future Labour government. And, you know, politically, in many ways, that makes sense. You know, it's not like we're a party that wants to up the VAT rate. So in a way, they're simply agreeing with us now. So, you know, but um, but I do think what is significant in that is if you leave yourself a very narrow room for manoeuvre, you can be caught in the problem that, say, Theresa May found. You know, one of the reasons for her calling the election in 2017 was because of all of the promises that had been made by the Tories in 2015 and she felt she no, you know, she wanted to deviate from some of those, and needed an election to have, therefore, the political mandate to do so. So I do think it is, it it's both a very safety first approach by Labour what we're seeing in this campaign, but it is also quite a risky one, in terms of what it gives them scope to do. My guess would be that what they're thinking is we are just going to build and build and build, and that will get economic growth going, and that will generate tax revenues to allow us to start achieving and so it's poss- quite likely that i think one of the big challenges for us as a party in the next parliament will be getting the balance right between support you know rightly opposing badly planned profiteering developments mm. but on the other hand not just being instinctively the nimbies in response to everything that labor's doing and there is absolutely and you know bill and other colleagues especially the wonderfully named Keith House you know in Eastley have shown exactly how you can get that balance right and you can get infrastructure built you can get houses built 
and you can do it in a way that protects the environment that actually strengthens local communities and that means we carry on winning elections but i suspect that's going to be one of our big challenges in the next few years is getting that path right between you know mad obsession with building on everything and mad opposition to opposing building on anything ever yeah and i suppose i mean one of the other things that we have to consider i mean obviously all this is based on what we're talking about the next parliament mm. hey let's make sure the lib dems get enough MPs in there to be relevant in the next parliament but actually the the def not defections so the resignations of so many within this parliament who are not mm. standing again mm. there will be a, the the 2024 cohort is going to be a lot of new faces and i suppose that institutional knowledge that we talk about like when i'm a, a my, the charity i'm a trustee of about keeping institutional knowledge and the benefit of that now what's going to happen in the next parliament with that with a lot of new candidates mm. who are newly selected not like used to the party machine or anything like that, that's going to be a, a really interesting dynamic in the next one as well. Because, I mean, for me, I've got, my prediction was Labour would have a majority of about 25, which is actually, if you think about the left-wing MPs and new MPs that are slightly um, less keen to obey the whip, and a difficult economic circumstances, it could be a very, very fraught first term for the Labour Party. And as Bill mentioned earlier, us being a sensible, moderate, liberal balancing point within the next parliament is really important. And I suppose then that kind of leads us right back to the start where we say, for us to have that balance, we need to get people elected. And so I'm going to first mark and then Bill, you're, we're going to do lots of these episodes over um, over the, the, the next five weeks where I'm not tired and exhausted from delivering and, and campaigning. But Mark, for the next week, what do you think Lib Dem activists across the country should be getting up to? Please help in your nearest target seat. You'll have had an uh, email started going out from the past yesterday, letters in the post asking members, yeah, giving members a specific seat to please go and help in. Um, that list of seats has been very carefully put together based on all of our latest polling, canvas data, how many members are in different local parties, you know, trying to match up the levels of help, you know, appropriately to, to what we need. Please do that. I mean, just remember 2019, our vote share was up by half. It wasn't a triumph. Seat numbers is overwhelmingly the thing that will make us happy or sad you know, the day after polling day. Alongside that, of course, lots more people suddenly, you know, interested in politics because it's an election and there's a really important role in building up local organisations. So if I can just give a quick shout out to uh, Aylesbury, Cardiff and the Vale of Glamorgan and North Edinburgh, East and Leith, because they're the three local parties that have recruited the most new members in the last week. So they've got themselves in a stronger position for winning future elections. So build up your, your infrastructure locally and then go help win votes in target seats, because the more MPs we have, the more we'll be able to implement all of those lovely policies we've been talking about. And just before I leave Bill to sign us off uh, on this uh, on his first ever episode, I suppose one thing I've done for uh, for my local team is obviously we want to encourage loads of people to go help Lisa and Tom in Stockport and, and up in Tim's Patch. But actually what you don't want to happen is if new people turn up who can't maybe travel to those seats, make sure you have something for them to do yeah. because it might be the first time they've ever got involved with it because... You know, I got involved in politics because of national policies, and then I realised how much I love reporting potholes. Um, but actually, making sure you have something for them because nothing's worth. I'm really excited. I'm really excited. We've got nothing for you to do is not a great way exactly. of keeping them active. So, Bill, what about you? What should we be doing over the, the next week? Uh, yeah, I'm just just thinking back to uh, to previous election campaigns. Um, so very much feel that our time has come. Um, and uh, we, we just need one more heave and we should march towards the sound of gunfire. Um, <laughs> we absolutely, we yeah, the, the, the battle set, brown seats are, are where we've got a direct resource where where it is uh, movable, where it's flexible. Um, and absolutely, we, we Mark's spot on with it's the number of MPs we got we get elected. But John's also also right. It's around us developing and building the party mm -hmm. back up. Absolutely. in places so yeah absolutely we have to not everybody has the has the desire or or ability to be able to 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 get to a target seat some miles away in which case make sure they've got something to do and make sure we show anybody who 
comes along, volunteers, make sure we show them some love, appreciation, and uh, welcome them into our our wonderful Lib Dem family. Um, it's, uh, it's 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 it'll be a fantastic ride wherever you end up, whether it's in a in a pothole or in Parliament. <laughs> Absolutely wonderful. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much, Bill. Thank you, Mark, and thank you everyone for watching and listening to this uh, podcast from the Lib Dem podcast on the Never Mind the Bar Charts podcast. Do go out there. I have actually just bought new running trainers because my my last pair got me through the locals, and I'm sadly not going to get me through the general. So do look after yourself, and remember, this is really important. You do need to give yourself breaks as well. You Absolutely. cannot run at 100% for five weeks without burning out. Make sure you have breaks. Make sure you have a, a weekend or an hour where you watch the football or the rugby or whatever it is. But okay. keep, keep going. Remember to talk to your team. Remember to get involved with those target seats. And we'll see you in another episode in about a week or so. Okay, thank you very much, everyone.